Amen and God bless saints. Thanks for joining us again this Sunday here at Roots in Christ Ministries where we live in faith and we love in Christ. Saints, today's message is actually going to come from a question that I was posed earlier uh, this week. Uh, a friend of mine uh, reached out to me and asked me, hey, I have a question for you. Um, it's a dating question. Um, what is God's position on interfaith relationships? What is God's God's position on interfaith relationships? And I asked her, well, if you don't mind sharing, what's, what's the other person's faith? You know, knowing that she is a Christian. She said, well, he's... He's Jewish. I said, okay, all right. Well, let me let me ask this question, and this is actually the most valid question. Do both of you believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and your Savior? Do both of you believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins, rose on the third day, that Jesus Christ is, in fact, the Son of God and 100% God himself? Do you both believe that? And she said, I, I knew you were going to say that. I knew you were going to say that. And she's been wrestling with it. And, you know, just the thing that really hit my heart on this message, saints. And if you notice, if you notice, my response really wasn't a direct answer. But really what it was is, in, number one, if I, I asked if both of you, both of you believe that, right? Because there so often there are many Christians, we walk around and we don't have the consideration of Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, yet we call ourselves Christians, followers, followers of Christ. And then, in fact, there are some Jews that are Messianic Jews that believe Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior. Some, even some called Jews for Jesus. Amen. Well, it provoked me to think about not just marriage and dating, but also our fellowship, our fellowship. And that led me to the text where we're coming from this morning. Um, we're going to be coming from 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, where it reads, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers, for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What arrangement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Last week, my message was along the lines of your worship will reveal your purpose. Well, today is somewhat of a second part. Your fellowship will reveal your purpose. Your fellowship will reveal your purpose. This morning, I'd like to speak succinctly to the value that God places on fellowship. And when I say fellowship, I am talking about our fellowship with him, right? I'm talking about our fellowship with his son, with his Holy Spirit, our fellowship with fellow believers, our fellowship. And really what we're talking about is what we what we have in common, what we come together to bond over, right? I'm, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but but some additional text I'd like to, to use. Um, I'd like to come from the book of John, chapter 18, verse 36, where Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from a, another place. One of the reasons why I wanted to bring up God's kingdom is because saints of God, if you think about it, everything that we do and how we live and everything that we say and everything that embodies what we are as believers, it, 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 it circles around us being a part of God's kingdom, God's kingdom, God's kingdom. But I also want us to take special note that, that God's kingdom and what I would call the secular kingdom or the, the kingdom of darkness, they actually function in parallel. They function simultaneously and their existence is in the same atmospheres at times. I don't, I don't necessarily mean they're in the same places, but they're in the same atmospheres, but they never co 
mingle. They never co-mingle. In other words, you can't be a part of the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness at the same time. Oh, no. And then that becomes the warning to those that don't know the Lord. You can't be a part of the kingdom of darkness or the king, kingdom of the secularism and be a part of the kingdom of God. Some other text I'd like to use, Luke chapter 17, verse 20, where it reads, once having been asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, the kingdom of God does not come with your careful observation, nor will people say, here it is or there it is, because the kingdom of God is within you. I believe the King James Version says the kingdom of God is at hand, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I know, saints of God, that even for this conversation with Jesus to let people know that the kingdom of God is at hand, the kingdom of God is within you, this can lead to confusion to people in the world. Why is that? Because the kingdom is here because the king is here. Somebody ought to get into a holy dance right now. The kingdom is here because the king is here. So wherever the king reigns, the kingdom exists. Does does the kingdom of God reign in your life? In in your home? Yeah, yeah. In in you, in you. And this also relegates the effectual power of of God to every promise of God unto salvation, right? So to the heart of the individual believers as a part of the corporate existence of the kingdom of God, we ought to find solace and solidarity in knowing the fact that, that when Jesus came, he didn't just come to leave us high and dry, but when he came with him, he actually bought the opportunity for us. Hear what I say? Hear what I say when I say this? He bought the opportunity for us to actualize in the Lord's prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And for so long, saints, even me as a young man, and I mean real young, right? Because very quickly I learned that when we are looking for the kingdom of heaven, we don't have to wait until we pass from this earth in order to be citizens. Our citizenship begins totally upon accepting Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Does it mean we have to be perfect and we, we, we have to get to the point where we're walking on water? Absolutely not. But what it means is Jesus Christ is always first our, as always our first consideration, regardless of what we do, where we go, and how we live. Again, somebody ought to jump into that second holy dance. The next side of this, particularly as it pertains to fellowship, we, we got to recognize, saints, that our fellowship with the world is, is almost non-existent. We don't have true fellowship. In other words, things in common with the world. Why is that? Well, first of all, and, and, and now I must indict us, is the world looks at us and they don't see what makes us different. And they have difficulty already understanding eternality eternality through Christ, eternality through redemption and salvation. And because many of us live a life like mixed nuts, you know what I mean? Those containers where you buy and it has all these different nuts. And if you're not careful when you pour them in your hand and just throw them in your mouth, you know, it takes a minute for you to even resolve whether to differentiate what nut is what nut in your mouth. Why? Because it's all mixed. And saints of God, we are so mixed in with the world saints, that we look like them, we smell like them, the same seasoning that they get put on them falls on us. And the unfortunate side, if I can just be blunt, is the salt that we are supposed to live in quite often doesn't make it to them. In other words, we begin to act like nuts when God has made us to be pretzels. You'll get that subliminal momentarily. But you've got to understand, saints, that when the world sees us and we are cursing and speaking crassly and horrifically just like them, they can't tell the difference. And don't get me wrong, saints. You know, just the real problem is, is that that the world doesn't, since they don't understand what redemption is, right, that the Lord bought us with a price and they can't really relate 
to what's in the natural, to the supernatural, even though the supernatural is the essence of all existence, they don't understand the fact that, yeah, when I when I used to drink, and I'm talking about I'd take it to the head, toss the bottle up, and, and would, would drain the bottle till it was gone, 40 ounces, sometimes 64 ounces. That's that's the Billy D that they remember. They remember the Billy D that would look for any anything running by him and oh, spit that game, talk some stuff, get to know you a little better, right? They remember that hound dog, that wild jackal that used to run through the city with that with that uh what did I used to carry about 357, right? That nine millimeter. They they remember that Billy D. They don't they don't recognize that there's been a change in Billy D so that as my, my my friend Kevin told me, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, Billy D is dead. And really what he was saying is that there's a new resurrected life that's in me so that now I'm a man of God. How many of you still live up to your old nicknames? I know some of you, Billy D, where'd that? Well, William Davidson, Bill Davidson, do you want my hand to fall off, right? Let me keep going. And since the world doesn't recognize the economies of Christ, we cannot establish partnership with the world. Let me say that again. Since the world doesn't recognize the economies of Christ, we cannot establish partnerships with the world. This may come as a shock to some of you because pastor so often and so frequently preaches about us being in the world, right? In order to win people to Christ, we actually need to be in the world. But really, the next level of that is we don't need to be everywhere the world is. And what I'm talking about is we should be extending the invitation wherever we are to come to the kingdom of God. Unfortunately, since we are commingled with the world, we are accepting their invitation into darkness. And quite often what that looks like is us as believers backsliding and quite often missing the mark that God has established for us to draw people into the kingdom, thusly losing our flavor. How, how many people really take Go buy a, a container of salted nuts and run it under the sink first to wash all the salt off, right? So now all you eating is just one bucket of soggy nuts, right? It's, it's horrible. It's horrible. Unless you just don't like flavor, right? But understand, saints of God, I, I, I want to qualify what I'm saying with some text. Coming from Matthew chapter 16, verse 13, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the son of man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Saints, this is the question that the Lord is asking you. Who do you say he is? Is Jesus just simply a, a great prophet? Is he someone that you just spend time with? Let me help somebody have something in common with. Let me help somebody fellowship with on Sunday. Is, is that all Jesus is good for? A good Sunday holler, a good Sunday tear. Is that all Jesus is good for? And at the end of the day, I would argue, do you really have a relationship with our Lord and Savior if the only time you even think about him is on Sunday, which now begs the question, who do you say he is? When in fact, we know he is an on-time and an all-time God, that He his, his salvific power is not relegated to one day, one hour, one minute, but it is eternal power that Jesus Christ brings to us. And if that's the case, then why aren't we deferring to him more often, more frequently? What is your fellowship like with Jesus? In other words, who do you say Let me get into some other texts. Picking up here, Matthew 16, picking up at verse 16. Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. 
right quick. A lot of times people get confused about what binding, this whole concept of binding and loosing. Well, even if you were to just look at the word bind and go back to its Greek origins, you find that that word means obligate. Whatever you obligate on, on earth will be obligated in heaven. And then when we talk about loose, I like this definition I pulled. Loose means to be annulled or to be unbound. To be or become an old, conceived of as an obligation being or becoming not restrained or tied down by bonds. In other words, there's no restraint. There's nothing that obligates you to do not to do. Understand, saints of God, if Jesus himself in conversation here with Peter recognizes that that Peter himself says that you are the son of the living God. How many of us actually throw that living in there? That we are children of the living God. We are heirs of the living God. And, and Jesus himself recognized that you only know this because God has shown you this. God has told you this. Saints of God, I don't know about you, but I would be excited if Jesus were to tell me, God is talking to you. Let me help you, saints. God is talking to you. God is talking to you. For those of you that have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, he's spoken to you. But not only that, the text even goes on to say that upon this rock I will build my church. And this rock that we're talking about is the firm establishment that Jesus Christ is the living son of God, the son of the living God. And there's nothing that the gates of hell can do against the, the church, the body of believers. But, but, but if you're not careful, you'll miss right here where he says, I give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. I give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. What, what really what God is saying is you have now direct access. He's given you your new home keys. Now, even now, while we're here on this earth, Somebody ought to jump into that third holy dance right now. God's given you now the keys into his kingdom. And he wants us to live a life <coughs> that considers what we're bound by and what we're loosing in from an eternal consideration. In other words, saints of God, there's some stuff that we just need to be letting go of in order that our eternal perspective, our eternal kingdom, our eternal dwelling is not does not become contaminated. Well, hold on, Pastor. How can it be contaminated? It can't be contaminated. Why? Because I've already established the point that, that the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of darkness do not co-mingle. So really, when we talk about contamination, we're talking about you as the temple of the living God now. Losing your keys? Pastor, are you saying you can lose your salvation? What I'm trying to tell you, saints of God, is you can walk away from your salvation because those keys that God gave you, they really belong to him. But again, everything that the Lord gives you, he gives you for you to be a good steward with. But guess what? You are an heir. You are an heir to the kingdom and to the keys of the kingdom when you live that life that is pleasing to God. Don't miss this, saints, and, and I don't even want to forget the fact that here in this text that now Peter's at a high point. He's just been validated by Jesus Christ. But then if we continue on reading Matthew 16, verse 21, and it's almost like they just took a couple of more steps from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he will go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Hold on. Jesus, just two to three steps prior 
told Peter himself that God is talking to him. God has revealed you. He's revealed to you who I am. Not only that, but he also ordained Peter to give him the kingdom, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. But then now as they continue to walk down the path, now Jesus just called Peter Satan. Let's, let's slow up on our holy dance on this one. This is kind of sad. Why? Because saints of God, I, I think all of us have found ourselves in this position, right? One minute we are of kingdom mind and then the next minute we are of men mind. Men, mankind mind. We start thinking like earthly beings. We don't consider what God's purpose is. And understand, saints of God, big picture. Jesus' purpose was to come to get on that cross. He's sitting here letting people know what's about to happen so they won't be caught off guard, right? You rec They recognized him as the Messiah. And I've got to go here, saints, because too often, many of us walk around one minute with being blessed and seeing only what God reveals to us only to the next minute to be Satan's. What, pastor? Hold on, pastor. Christians can't be possessed. Well, let me give some context. So the same language where Jesus is calling Peter uh, Satan is the same language that he actually spoke to Satan when he was being tempted at his baptism, right? Uh, after his baptism, when he was in the wilderness, when Jesus was, right, fasting, and he was in the wilderness, and Satan began to tempt him. Satan began to tempt him. For my note takers, Satan is always looking for opportunities to tempt. And as a matter of fact, if you go back and you read about that, you'll find that that was just the first time or just one of times where Satan would begin to tempt Jesus. And here is another one. Satan was in the midst, not as a possessor of Peter, but as an influencer. What do you mean influencer? Saints of God, there's too often times where we think we know better than Jesus, that we know better than God. And when we find ourselves beginning to argue and refute the text and God's will and God's move of his Holy Spirit, when we begin to argue against him, and even if you read the text, it said that Peter even rebuked Jesus. How are you going to rebuke Jesus? Right? How are you going to firmly, strongly chastise Jesus when it's his will that be done? In other words, saints, we need to do some mind correction. We need to do some mind correction. You know, and I, I want to talk to my, my married couples, and I'm almost done. I want to talk to my married couples right quick, because I think quite often time when we talk about fellowship, fellowship does begin, guess what? It begins between you and the Lord, but then it should begin to spread in the home. And I think there are times where God has given us a goal and he's given us a vision. And quite often as he gives the husband, the head of the household, the vision, there are times where there are people, and let me, let me let's be specific, where there's led by the wife will work against the vision that God has given the head of the household. And then ultimately what you find is the wife being a stumbling block as well as bringing the kids along because the kids, they spend all the time with mama and they hear what mama said. And now the kids even begin to chime in and berate and talk bad and crazy about that. Dad is just crazy. Dad, dad is silly. Saints of God, don't you know that that is nothing but the influence of Satan to thwart the vision that God has given? Pastor, why are you getting on wives today? Because if the husband is the first point of accountability when God comes into the Garden of Eden and he's going to ask, Adam, where art thou? Even though he's calling for both of you, he's really calling for the man to step up to his point of accountability, not only to receive this day our daily bread, but to also receive the accolades and the celebration in order for the entity of the family to recognize that they are living in the will of God or to receive the buke, the rebuke for not. Saints, here's the other side of it, saints. There are times when the husband is not in the position of accountability and the wife is, is she sees what God is trying to show her husband and she's living to be obedient to her husband, but also knows that there are times where he's going to lead them down the, the incorrect path. What does she do? Does she pull back? No, saints of God, it is a wife's 
gold where she should always and continually be looking to win her husband to the Lord. I mean, didn't we deal with this? Didn't Paul deal with this in Galatians and in Corinthians? It is your objective where you should always be looking to win souls to the Lord. Who better than your husband? Who better than your family? And that's when, when you can recognize that Satan is, is, is influencing that head of household. But that doesn't mean you give up. That doesn't mean you stop praying. And that doesn't mean you start calling him names and cussing him out and talking bad about him to the kids. How do you win anybody to Christ when you are slapping them in the face? Our fellowship, our fellowship, our fellowship in our home is so important, saints of God. And again, when we talk about fellowship, coming from the, the Greek koinia, the fellowship of actually being in common, having in common, living in common. Let me close out with this. Jesus' rebuke to Peter to tell him to be gone is an intense back off and, and we need to be ready to say back off to things that, and people that we don't or, or aren't in commonality with the problem with our christian fellowship saints is all too often we we are too nice to satan we're too nice to him when he shows his ugly head why because in today's society we want to be nice we want to be nice as speakers, as well as receivers, we've got to play nice. And then we begin to take up the devil's cause and we end up losing the testimony that God has for us. In other words, saints of God, there is some suffering that we very well, uh, God has called us to, to go through, but we won't even walk through that testimony because we want to play nice. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, stop playing nice. Yeah, yeah, we want to play nice. And ultimately, we work against Jesus' plan for deliverance when we step without embracing Jesus' plan. But that's why I can find celebration in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10, chapter 10, verse 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3, that says, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments of every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience once your obedience is complete. In other words, it's time to stop playing nice. It's time to stop playing nice. Saints of God, right now we're living in a world where we want to play nice with people when it comes to racism. And what I'm talking about is some of the people that call everything racism, racism, she has black clothes on. That's racist. And it seems that foolish nowadays. Everything is racism. We got one young lady at a Duke volleyball game and saints of God, lo and behold, she said somebody was, people were chiming the N-word to her the whole time. She's playing her volleyball game, yet there has not been any video footage or anything to show itself yet. And here's the problem, saints, is if, in fact, there was a, 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 a determination through an evaluation of various news and media and camera sources where people are not chiming in her and calling her the N-word, where is she hearing it? Where is she hearing it? I would argue not in the natural, but in the supernatural. It's time to stop playing nice from a standpoint of allowing Satan to have that on us because there are times we hear things, saints, saints. We hear things and it hasn't really been said. But that's why we've got to be in God's word so that we hear the word of God so that when we hear the unsaid, it's from our savior. We need to stop saints of God playing nice with feminism. We need to stop playing nice with homosexuality. That part of the reason why we have our identity crisis nowadays is because we've been playing nice. We need to stop playing nice with people that want to argue about global warming one minute, 
Then climate change the next minute. Pastor, what do you mean? This is, hasn't that been proven a scientific fact? Saints of God, I'm going to tell you something. First of all, whose science tells you that God is not in control of the world? Whose science will tell you that God is not in control of the hearts of men and mankind? Who's, hear what I say, whose science will tell you that men and women are the same? We're not. God made us differently for different purposes. We have different strengths and different weaknesses. Whoever tells you that there is more than one sex, more than one, I'm sorry, more than two sexes, meaning more than two genders, when God made a man first and God made a woman, everything after that is nothing but fellowship with Satan. Everything after that are lies. Everything after that is working against God's plan. What's God's plan? First, to redeem us from our lost state. And then for us to fellowship first with him and then with each other. I said all of this to say today, let's make sure that our fellowship with the Lord is fellowship after his purpose. It's fellowship after what he's, the path he's laid for us, which means, yes, we need to be in constant communication with him. And guess what? When we fellowship with each other, it's simply an extension of our fellowship with him. Saints of God, when you come to me and you talk to me, you don't want to hear what I think. You want to know about according to God's word. What is God's will for my life? Because if I tell you what I think, Pat, you catch me on the wrong day, pastor has screws loose. But the thing is, my walk with the Lord, if you ask me what, what, what God's will is, I'm going to go to God's word. I'm going to seek God's will. That way I'm not drawn by my emotionalism of the perception of racism. I'm not, I'm not living by my emotion, by the perception of injustice and inequality and inequities. I'm not drawn by that from my loose screw mentality. But I live in the fellowship of the Lord who is in control of it all. And if we would trust in him, he'll direct our paths to righteousness. Amen. Eternal and almighty God, we thank you for this word this morning. We thank you first and foremost for extending your hand of fellowship to us that simply by faith and by trusting in you, dear Lord, that we can live a life, a life of victory, a perpetual victory, a life that recognizes there is nothing, no weapon formed against us that shall prosper. We can live a life in recognizing that though we are in this world, we are not of this world, but you've given us everything that we need to succeed and to live and to prosper in it, but not that we desire to prosper in this world, but we prosper in the kingdom of God so that our overrun cup pours into this world, that others recognize your majesty. They see our good works and they glorify you. That souls be one to Christ. Strengthen our fellowship, dear Lord, with you, so that our fellowship with the world can be that of winning souls, perpetually winning souls. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.